Well, hello everybody. English is not my native language, so forgive me if I make some mistakes. And the same that in the previous session, I'm here to get some feedback. I'm from Argentina. I'm trying to teach object-oriented programming using Smalltalk and some other stuff. And this is an adventure for us because we are facing some challenges that I want to share with you. Maybe you are facing the same challenges. So I expect this to be a, a feedback loop, right? So let's start. The first of all, I want to say is that I teach at the University of Buenos Aires. It's the biggest university in, in, in my country in terms of the size uh, of the budget and the number of students. In that university, you can study two different things that are very, very different from our point of view. You can study computer science or you can study software engineering. Yeah? If you choose to study computer science, it means that you will be prepared to work as a researcher, right? You will be a scientist. And if you study software engineering, you are prepared to, be, to work in the industry. It doesn't mean that if you are a software engineer, you can't work in research, but the subjects you will get during your studies will be quite different. Just to give an example, if you study computer science, you will have two or three subjects about software engineering. If you study software engineering, you will have about 15 subjects about software engineering. Yeah? I don't know if you have these, um, these different things in your universities, but this is our case. In my case, I teach at the software engineering studies, so I work for the engineering faculty, and you can study software engineering, but then in the same place you can study building, industrial electricity, chemistry, or other kinds of engineering. This has an interesting impact in how the, the study program was built because somebody says, well, if you are gonna be an engineer, no matter what is your specific topic, you have to know about basic science. So we will see that during the first years, when you want to be a software engineer in this university, you have to study a lot of math, physics, and chemistry. That doesn't happen to those that want to study computer science, yeah? But in our case, this is the situation. So, I said that this were uh, the story of our adventure teaching object-oriented programming, and our first challenge is the background of our students. This is more or less the program during the first years. Everybody that gets into our university, during the first year, you have common introductory subjects. That means that you have six, sub six subjects that include basic science and general culture. During the first year, nothing of programming, nothing of computer, right? During the second year, you will study basic science again and something of programming. Yeah? During the second year, you will learn um, basic algorithms and abstract data types. In most of the cases, programming with C or Pascal. We have an experimental course that's working with uh, Python, but it's just one course out of six. And at the same time, you have to study math, physics, and chemistry. So only 25% of your time will be dedicated to software, right? After that, in the third year, you will learn object-oriented programming. So this is the background of our students. Yeah? Is it clear till now? Yeah? At the same time, if we review what our students know, most of them have been programmed with C or Pascal. No more, no other languages. If they took the experimental course, they maybe can program with Python. That is an interesting difference. 
Well, this is after our first challenge. Our second challenge is the number of students we have. Each semester we have 150 students. That is an interesting number, and well, we have to manage this, this size of students, right? And the third challenge is the industry. Because we are in an engineering faculty, the industry expects us to prepare people to work in the industry, and in most of the cases, the industry is working with Java and Microsoft technologies. That is a fact, yeah? And what happened to us? At the same time, students that take courses in the engineering faculty, they expect to work in the industry. Most of them wants to work in the industry. So we find the industry that expect us to teach Java, and we have the students that expect to learn Java, because today Java is the mainstream, right? So these are the three challenges that we are facing today. Well, the rest of my presentation will, will be how we are tackling these three challenges, right? And if you have some ideas about how can it be better, I'm open to listen. But, uh, but before that, I want to know if some of you are facing similar challenges and at the same time, how many of you are involved in academics uh, concerns? Maybe teaching at the university, maybe studying. Could you raise your hands? Okay. And how many of you are facing similar challenges? Okay, so it will be interesting to give some feedback. Well, some, something wants to say, somebody wants to say something about this, maybe add your own challenge. Hi, Nico. Okay. Use this. Okay, so, um, I'm from Argentina too, you know, uh, from a different uh, university, but um, we face pretty much of the same problems. And the thing is that um, apart from having the um, what, what the industry ask for uh, from us to to prepare uh, in in the studies of the students the thing is that most of the students already are working so uh, they come to the first object oriented class thinking that they they know and it's pretty hard to um, to manage that knowledge because uh, maybe it's not what we want to teach. Uh, I, I am sure it happens the same to you. Yes, but they, they come from the industry with some bad habits. Right, right. Something very common in our case is that we find that when we ask, we give the, the, the students some programming task, they come with a design that they have some objects that only contains data and some objects that only contain behaviors and all static methods. That is, is very common. And, well, of course, it's, it's a challenge for us also, but I think that most of our students are not working at that point of, of, of their studies. Right. Uh, I have another challenge for you. It's uh, here. Yeah. Uh, this is convince your colleague to teach small talk. Because most of the time, the, bah, for my colleagues, they are bashing me because I'm teaching small talk. So, <laughs> so well, it's sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's an interesting point that I teach in a, in a public university, so we have freedom to select what tools do we use. So we have to ensure that they control us what uh, concepts we are teaching, but we are free to choose any tool that we 
consider appropriate for the case, right? Okay, well, I continue. So, I, I think I will say some things that could be a little bit controversial, right? But I don't want us to lose the focus. Our focus is to teach object-oriented programming. We don't want to teach a technology. We don't want to teach Smalltalk or Java or C Sharp. We want to teach object-oriented programming. And we are going to use the more appropriate tool for doing that, right? So this is the, the disclaimer. So I continue. And well, of course, we have some complementary topics that we teach along the course, that like, for example, UML, user interface design, software development life cycles, some engineering practices, some agile practices, and some specific tools like Faro, SVN, Eclipse, and so more. Well, this is our course structure. We have a lecture once a week that is in charge of um, the professor is about two or three hours, and this is in an auditorium like this one for 150 students. And then we have once a week practical sessions. For those practical sessions, the students are split into three groups, and in these practical sessions are three hours long, more or less. These three hours are divided into three different kinds of activities. Most of the cases during the first hour, we explain them how to use some tools. For example, when we teach Faro, we show them how to launch the image, how to use the browser, the transcript, the object browser, and that kind of stuff. That's during the first hour. During the second hour, we practice with some exercises. We have a, a list of exercises, so we give them time to do the exercises and then we solve them together. And during the last hour, we answer questions from the students, right? That in, mo in most cases are related to the programming tasks that they have to do at home, right? This is our team. It's a quite big team. Carlo Fontella is the professor. Pablo Suarez is in charge of coordinating the different groups of practical um, classes. And then, well, the different people that is collaborating in each of the practical classes groups. Well, this could be a little bit controversial because we are not using small talk ex exclusively. We are working with different implementations because our goal is to teach object-oriented programming and there are different implementations of the same paradigm. So we use different tools. Nowadays, we are not using C++ or an and an Objects Pascal, but we mention them during the course because, for example, C++ implements uh, multiple inheritance. Yes, and that is something that we cannot show with, with Smalltalk or with Java. And there are certain other things that are different in this language, for example, um, in C++ and Object Pascal, you, do, you don't have a virtual machine, so you have to take care of memory management, right? So we use these languages as tools to show certain concepts. And at the same time, we do use Smalltalk and Java along our, our course, right? I will show how we use these tools, right? But the idea is we want to show how can you implement um, an object-oriented language with um, dynamic types and with the static types, right? There are certain differences that are very interesting to analyze and compare between these two kinds of implementations. So we have certain programming tasks along the course. That means we have two programming tasks. I don't know if programming task is the, the best translation. What I mean by programming task is we give them some work to do at home and they have a fixed deadline to give it back. 
if, you do, if they don't give it back, they can't continue with the course, right? They are mandatory programming tasks, right? The first two are with small talk. They have, in most of the cases, one time frame, one week of time frame, yes? We give it today, and in exactly one week, they have to give it back completed, and it means that they have to uh, prepare the, the source code to, to build the solution, and also a report with some UML diagrams and maybe some explanations of the design they choose. And of course, unit tests. In, in particular, these two first programming tasks, we give them some tests that they have to pass. We give them the, the source code of this test, and they also have to ask some more tests specific to their implementation, right? And during the last months of classes, we give them another programming task to be completed in, in teams. Each team has four members, or three or four members, and we assign each team a, a, a teacher that acts as a tutor and guides them along the programming task that takes between four and six weeks to complete. In most of the cases, um, we, we need six weeks because it's a quite big application. And of course, they have to um, prepare a source code, they have to build a, a report with the design decisions using UML and some other things. They have to prepare unit tests, and they also have to give us the, the executable, I mean. It's, a, it's a, a complete application. In the first cases, are just uh, tests. They have to mm, program test. We are not asking them to build a, a full application, right? What it's working for us is that each of our programming tasks are related to games. Because we think that, not, not, not only we think, we saw that uh, students get a little bit exciting about programming games. So we have uh, give them to program um, different kind of games. More, most of them are, um, well, uh, you can see there, chess, tower defense, bomberman, Galaga, Mario Bros, Pac-Man, that kind of things. Very simple games that you can identify briefly uh, a hierarchy of classes with different behaviors, right? And in some cases, it's very good to program unit tests against the behaviors of these different classes. So we think that we are getting good results with this because the students get very motivated with this. So for example, in this case, I think I rem if I don't get wrong, um, these screenshots are for this game that is a variation of the Bomberman. I don't know if you remember the Bomberman. It's a simple game that I think was part of Nintendo platform, something like that. So this was the, the second uh, programming task that was built in the small talk. And after this, we asked them to program with mm, Java or C Sharp. They can choose what language to use. And in that case, I think that we program a Pac-Man or something like that. Yeah, our, our approach is we start the lectures talking about theory, just theory. We don't, we show some code in, in the lectures, but we don't go in, in much detail. And in the practical classes, we start working with the small talk during the first programming task. That's about two or th two and a half months. And then we switch to Java or C Sharp. For us, it's exactly the same. They can choose what language to use. And then they have the group R programming task. Right? Five minutes, OK. Well, what other things do we do? We give the students some mandatory readings. I just mentioned four of them, but each year we have seven 
mandatory readings. We give this the students. In most of the cases are uh, papers or some chapter for s from certain books. And then we ask about these readings in the exams. Um, what else? Some tools that we use, we, uh, we have a, a mailing list for the students where students send their questions and the teachers try to answer, but also the other students try to answer. We try to encourage the students to answer their, their um, colleagues, classmates, right? We also have a, a private mailing list for the teachers. We have a website when, where we put all the material that we use during the classes. We have a, pub a private SVN for the teachers where we have version, several versions of the material that we use. And we have a, a checklist. Well, several checklists before publishing, uh, no, not before. When we publish a programming task, we give the students a checklist that is the checklist that we will use to correct the programming task, right? I think, well, the, later I can, I can show an example if you want. But this way, we apply the same criteria to correct the programming task. So the students know how we are going to correct their works so they can run the checklist on their own and they can guess if they will, be, if they will pass or not the programming task, right? Well, I almost at the end. Well, this is about our process. We, as a team, work this way. At the beginning of, the, of each course, of, the, of each semester, we do some planning. We meet a couple of times to prepare the whole semester, to assign classes to different teachers, and to select the papers we are going to give to the students, and we also try to define what will be the programming tasks. In these planning uh, meetings, we also try to review the feedback that the students gave us the previous course. Then we execute our project, that means we go through the whole course during four months, and when we reach the last class, we do a review with the students. Yes, this is like the review uh, proposed by, by a Scrum methodology, right? We gather the students in, in the room and we use some of the techniques proposed um, by Diane Larsen. I don't know if you know ab about her, but she's a girl that wrote a book about retrospectives and reviews. So we use some of those techniques and we, we try to gather feedback from the students. After that, we do uh, our retrospective, but without the students. I mean, we as, uh, as the, the team of teachers, right? So in that retrospective, the team of teachers review the feedback provided by the students. We also try to, to evaluate ourselves. And based on, on that, we define some to do actions to implement in the next semester, right? The, the, the things that we get from there are used in the next planning meeting. This way we try to improve our course every semester. Well, I think that I'm almost in the end. So, questions maybe? Critics? Uh, it is sometimes hard to uh, relearn uh, than uh, learning. Uh, have you tried uh, the other way, uh, Java, C++ first, and then Smalltalk? Yes, we have tried different approaches. When we, I start um, working in, in this course about seven years ago, when I was a student, uh, we used Object Pascal and C++, then we switched to Java, then we added 
um, C sharp, and the students could choose between them. And three years ago, we had small talk, but we never work only with small talk. We always use, uh, I mean, from that point to now, I mean, since three years ago, we always use a mixed approach. And in the beginning, we try first with Java and then switch to Smalltalk. And now we think that the best option is to start with Smalltalk and then switch with Java. One interesting point is that our students, when they arrive to our course, they know to program with C, only C, and they are very tied to memory management. So that leads us to uh, try to start try to start the course working with Java because it has very similar syntax. But after two semesters, we decide that we wanted to try the other approach, starting with small talk, and we think we get better results. Yep. Uh, can it's the other presenter come up and start setting up? Well, then we can have a few more questions. Okay, just a second. If you want, I can give you some contact information. This is our website. You can find all the teaching material we're using. It's there, it's public under a free license, so you can use it. And there is my email and some other things, right? So, yes, your question. Yeah, uh, actually, it's a comment and uh, re experience report because I am in the same situation. I, I started teaching uh, in my university since uh, like nine, nine years when I arrived. There were a Java course and C++ course. And then uh, I th simply threw away the C++ course and started doing a small talk course instead and then found out that students understo understand better with, with small talk. And then what's, what's I'm running since uh, like three, four years now is that I'm doing exactly the same course, the same exercise, but first in small talk and then in Java because I found out that there, are, there is too much noise in, uh, in Java from uh, the, the, the pedagogical point of view. So the students j simply get lost. And even doing this, they have better results in small talk than in Java. Yeah, uh, and regarding to that, what we faced is that when we started with Java, the students lot lost much time trying to set up the VM, environment variables, and many technical stuff that is not important for us. In the case of Java, in the case of Smalltalk, we use well, initially we use Squeak, now we are using Faro. They just download it, they open the image, and they have all they need there. So it, it's quite simple, very straightforward, and they can concentrate on what we need, that is objects and objects and objects, and not the technical stuff. Yeah. I, I still have an extra comment about the, the acceptance. Uh, I always, I'm always honest with my students. I tell them at the beginning of the course that the, the small talk market is a niche and probably they won't find a, a job in small talk. Still, I, I, I try my best to find uh, internships for them in, uh, in small talk co uh, companies and uh, I try to uh, f forward them uh, small talk job offers to see that there is something going on in the community and the community is alive and for the most motivated one, they can find a job in, uh, in, in, the m in this market. And actually, some of them are currently working in small talk. Well, in, in our case, in Argentina, there are some important companies that are using small talk. And some of the teachers, or of the group of teachers, are working in those companies. So it's interesting to have some people with important knowledge in, in the technology. And one more thing that I think is it's interesting to mention is that when, during the last two semesters, when we did the review with the students, lot of them, lot of them told us that they would like to do the whole course using Smalltalk. So that's very good for us because we think that we are in the in the wrong path. But we will continue with this approach, with this mixed approach, because we are um, convinced that it's the best way to learn the whole paradigm. Well, I think that I ran out of I ran out of time. 
So if some of you want to continue the talk, we can share a coffee later and we, we, we can talk. Thank you very much.